and thank you for joining. We'll give it a few more moments for others to hop on before we begin. I'm Jenny Lamb, and I'm the marketing director here at SJF Blog Group. I'll be monitoring tonight's webinar and working behind the scenes. We have Regina Drain here with us tonight. Regina is a guardianship and probate attorney here in the firm. She'll be leading tonight's discussion on guardianship. Since October is Guardianship Awareness Month, we're excited to have everyone here with us to discuss this important topic together. All right, and then I just want to quickly just talk about some housekeeping rules before we get started. We have a chat box on the right of your screen, so feel free to ask your questions in there. I will be monitoring mo monitoring the chat box. And then throughout the webinar, I'll be also be releasing a few different polls to check with our audience. Thank you all again, and then I'm handing it over to you now, Regina. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. If this is your second webinar with me, welcome back. If this is your first, it's very nice to meet you. Um, again, my name is Regina Drennan. Um, I'm an attorney here at the SJF Law Group, and I specialize in guardianship. So tonight we're going to do talk about what guardianship is and what the process is, kind of an, an overview, okay? Um, there's a chat box, so you're more than welcome to put in questions. During this, Jenny will have a poll just to kind of get some more information from everybody out there. So I've been practicing over 15 years and I work with um, families who have family members with autism, dementia, and mental health issues. Um, sometimes if people um, have done their estate planning, if they have a power of attorney, if they have a health care surrogate, they've already decided who's going to be in charge and who's going to take care of them. But sometimes we have situations where somebody has dementia, for instance, um, they haven't done any advanced directives. So the court needs to step in to give somebody the authority in order to make decisions on behalf of the um, of the alleged incapacitated person. So it's a two prong process. Um, we start with in the incapacity to determine what rights the person can keep and what rights can be taken away. This is filed in a mental health court, which is a confidential court. So any information that's in there is not accessible to the public because there's some um, very private intimate information that's put into these documents. So just know that for the mental health clerk, the incapacity side, nobody can just go and look everything up. So our first step would be we have to file a petition to determine incapacity. Basically, that includes the name, address of the petitioner and what their relationship is to the person who we're seeking to protect. They then contain the name, address, and the respondent of the AIP. We call the person who is in this process the alleged incapacitated person, and the initial is AIP. They are not considered the ward until there's been a finding of incapacity. So during this process, we'll refer to the AIP. And then we lay out the information um, as to why you think the person has incapacity, what their issues are, what your concerns, are there any diagnosis? So sometimes this will say the person has early onset Alzheimer's, dementia, um, they've had a brain injury where they're not able to make decisions, etc. And then we list out interested persons. Those are people who have knowledge and could give us information about the AIP. It's also family members. There's a hierarchy as to who has a right to give notice. It's usually the spouse, the kids, brothers and sisters, etc. And then we put some information about the primary physician. And I'll explain why that's important, but we try to put as much information as we have up front about the AIP in this petition to determine incapacity. So then what happens? So again, we're just looking at the incapacity part first. Um, so when you file a petition to determine incapacity, you are looking to affect someone's civil rights. So the court appoints essentially a public defender. You know, we've all watched TV and they tell you you have the right to an attorney. 
That also applies here because we are looking to affect someone's civil rights. Here in Broward County, we have a wheel. I guess most counties have a wheel where attorneys take certain classes, have certain requirements, um, meet certain criteria, and they're on a rotating list. So it's a random assignment. That person is appointed to protect the due process of the AIP. That's really the most important role because they, you know, you're looking to, to possibly take away someone's rights. So the attorney for the AIP is their defense attorney. They don't say, oh, I think this would be what's best for my client. They have to defend their client and whatever their client wants, they have to present to the court. So as you can imagine, there may be people who say, I'm not incapacitated. It doesn't matter how you feel as the court appointed attorney, that's what you have to present to the court. There's also an appointment by the court of three examining committee members. It consists of a physician. Every, every committee has a physician. And then there's a psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker, nurse, some combination of those three which are appointed and they receive an order that says, go out and examine the AIP within a certain amount of time and write a report. What's interesting is the order doesn't say that the AIP must be examined. So sometimes we have situations where the AIP does not wanna cooperate, doesn't wanna to talk to anybody, and that's their right. So you can't make them be examined, but you can tell these three people, you have to go out and meet with them and try and do an evaluation. During the evaluation, they do a mini mental status exam, which is registers on a scale, I think if it's 28 or 30. They, you know, they mention three words, then they ask what the words are later, who's the president, what's the day of the week, do you know where you are, et cetera. So there are different things that the, the examining committee does in order to um, determine whether or not they feel the person is competent as to certain rights. And their biggest responsibility is they file a report with the court and they talk about what they, um, what they discussed and what their recommendations are as to rights. So we're going to discuss Broward County because um, that's where I am. Every county is a little bit different, but um, at some point then there'll be a hearing set before the general magistrate. A general magistrate is kind of like a junior judge and they have more time to spend with us and go over and speak to the AIP and to the attorneys and such. That hearing for incapacity can be no less than 28 days from the date the petition for incapacity is filed. And again, that has to do with due process for the AIP. It doesn't mean you're gonna get a hearing on the 29th day. It just means you won't get it before 28 days. It seems like typically here in Broward, it probably takes six to eight weeks in order to get that incapacity hearing. So what, what does the examining committee look at? What rights are we talking about? So these are rights that can be removed, but not delegated. What that means is the right can be taken from you, but it can't be given to someone to do on your behalf. So for example, to marry, you can't get somebody else married, right? Um, you can't vote for them. You can't act as them applying for benefits. You can't drive for them, you can't travel as them, and you can't get a job for them. So that's what the difference is. These rights can be removed, but they can't be given to somebody else. Then there are rights that can be removed from the AIP and given to a guardian. So for example, the right to contract. We could take that right, say the person does not have the capacity to sign any contracts, but the guardian, can sign the contract on the person's behalf or they can the the guardian could sue and defend lawsuits so let's say the aip has a problem with their homeowners association 
the guardian can step in and protect them to apply for government benefits. So let's say they want the AIP, they want to put the AIP on Medicaid or Social Security or Social Security Disability, or we have open enrollment coming up. The guardian with the paperwork can apply on behalf of the AIP uh, to determine his or her residence. The guardian can, we can say, the court could say, you know, you can't decide where you're going to live. You need to go to a facility. And then the guardian can step in and make that decision and um, complete any paperwork. To own or possess a firearm, this came about because of Parkland MSD. If anybody has an, even one incapacity, they lose their right to own or possess a firearm. And a report gets filed with the state. I know some people say they would never go out and get a gun, but it's mostly about identity theft. They want to make sure that somebody doesn't try and steal the identity of an AIP and try and get a gun illegally. This is a big one to manage property or to make any gift or disposition of property. Sometimes people will come and they're very concerned that the AIP isn't making sound decisions, giving money away. We know um, phone scams are a big thing now. Internet scams, they're sending money over to, you know, Nigeria, etc. So the person would lose the right to do that, and then their guardian would step in and be able to do that on their behalf. Uh, consent to medical, mental health treatment, and educational decisions. Again, the AIP may not be able to do those things, so the guardian could step in. The reason we put educational is because sometimes we have young people who are in a guardianship and they can go to school until 22, but we still want to be able to make those decisions. To make decisions about social environment or other social aspects, that's more if somebody wants to come hang out with your AIP and you don't want them around. Or you can sign them up. I had one today where they want to be able to sign them up for Boy Scouts. So that's more, that comes in more when if there's somebody who wants to be around the person that you really don't want to be involved in their lives. And then again, we're just talking about the incapacity process. Once we have this hearing, the judge looks at the three reports that came in, talks to the attorney for the person who wants to be guardian, talks to the attorney for the AIP, the AIP has a right to be at the hearing. Sometimes they can contribute to the hearing. Sometimes they just can't. So their attorney can make the decision as to whether or not they can appear. So once that happens, the if it goes before a general magistrate, the general magistrate would write a report, which gets sent up to the judge who stamps it and ratifies it, which makes it into an order. So, so that is called the order determining incapacity. And then we move on to the next step, which is to have the guardian appointed. So remember, it's a two prong um, situation. So this is the first path that we take. So at the same time as we file a petition for incapacity, we file a petition to appoint a guardian. And it's important to know that in order to file the petition to appoint guardian, you must have the petition for incapacity also in process. The information that's involved is similar. It's the name, address, and the relationship of the petitioner, of the person who is concerned and wants a guardian to be appointed. The name and address of the respondent. Again, that's the person who needs the guardian. At this point, we're still calling the person the AIP, alleged incapacitated person because we're doing them both at the same time and the person has not been determined to be incapacitated yet. So alleged is the, the term that's used. And again, we talk about the diagnosis and why do they need a guardian? What are your concerns? What are their medical um, diagnoses? For example, early onset dementia, we're concerned that they're not able to take care of themselves. They're not making good medical decisions. They're not making good financial decisions. You lay out then what rights need to be removed. So let's just say you have an instance where the person 
really doesn't have any money but needs help making medical decisions, you can delineate which rights you want to take, you want evaluated and what rights you think the person can't keep. So it's not an all or nothing. Sometimes we can have people who just need help with their medical and applying for benefits. So just remember that it's not an all or nothing. Your, it's important to see that your petition for incapacity matches your petition for guardianship because they are intertwined and you want to make sure they're consistent. Where it differs here from the incapacity is we talk about what assets the person has in their name or in their name jointly. Because we want to notify the court that let's say there's a house, there's 401ks, there's bank accounts. We list out what we know in the petition to appoint a guardian. One of the most important things is, are there any lesser restrictive alternatives to guardianship? What that means is if the person has a durable power of attorney, has a healthcare surrogate, the person has the AIP has already decided who they want to be in charge of their life. So the court could say, yes, you have incapacity, but you don't need a guardian. You don't need court oversight because you already decided by doing your estate planning documents who you want to be in charge and you've already given away those rights. Um, I'm just looking at the poll. I skipped over it. So yeah, the 100% the answered that it needs a court process. And then it seems 50-50 as to whether or not people have heard of the guardianship before. Okay. So what happens? You come to an attorney, they say, we want to go ahead and file this guardianship. What do we do? So the first thing we do is what we talked about in the prior slide is the petition to appoint guardian. Then you also, as the potential guardian, have to file an oath of guardian. Basically, this is saying, this is my information. I'm going to listen to my attorney. If my attorney receives paperwork from me, it's the same as me getting the paperwork. That's but the second line that says designate our office to be their agent and accept service. We also do a petition for depository. If the AIP slash ward will start transitioning into that has any assets, they have to be held in a restricted account and locked down with court oversight. Money can go into the accounts, but money cannot come out without a court order. So we have to ask the, the court, we want, to, we want to appoint a particular depository. It has to be a bank within, with offices in Florida and meet certain um, financial institution criteria. But it's usually the big banks, um, you know, the typical banks that you would know. We do ask in the petition for depository that sometimes people have a large sum of money and we don't just want that sitting in a checking or a money market account. So we put additional language that allows the guardian to invest the funds. So they could open up a mutual fund, they could open up a brokerage account, et cetera. So it gives more options. Who can be a guardian? Well, let's talk about who can't be a guardian. You cannot be a convicted felon and be a guardian. So unfortunately, even if you have a conviction 30 years ago and you've done your time and you've been rehabilitated, unfortunately, you cannot be guardian. How does the court find out what your criminal record is? You have to get electronic fingerprints. Um, typically here in Florida, it's a UPS store. Um, sometimes if we have people from out of state who want to be the guardian, which is a possibility. We have them get what, we, what we're used to called the hard card. They go, they get the fingerprints done, and then we get it processed down here in Florida. You do an application. It basically looks like a job application. That's what people say when they, when they see it. They're like, oh, this is just like a regular application. It's, it's your personal information. It asks you some questions. The, the most important thing is questions about any arrests, convictions for felonies and non-felonies. It's disclose, disclose, disclose. 
because what happens is when you get the fingerprint back, it goes to the clerk of courts. They look at the report from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and they look at your application. So let's say you've been arrested for a misdemeanor. They just want to make sure you disclose that information and they, and they match it up. Okay, so we've gone through the process of the incapacity in the hearing and we had the three reports and the um, general magistrate has said, you know, all rights need to be removed from this person and given to somebody. We've got the guardianship where the final step is to make sure the person's background check comes back and they indeed are qualified in order to be the guardian. Um, we then submit documents, word documents basically to the judge. Um, the first one is the order appointing guardian, which basically says this person has petitioned to be the guardian of what we were calling the AIP. Once they are found to be incapacitated, they transition to being called the ward. Um, so the order says we're going, we appointed this person as guardian. Most important are the letters of guardianship that delineates the rights that have been uh, removed and delegated to this other person. So they're very detailed and they list out the right to marry, the right to vote, um, contract, sue and defend, et cetera. And then we talked about the depository. If the person had assets, we go ahead and um, do the petition designating depository. We get an order saying, yes, we want Chase Bank to be the depository, and they will accept this assignment. Okay, so you're appointed um, as the guardian. Then what happens? So we get you what's called um, certified copies of the letters and orders. That will give the authority to go to the bank, to get information about the person's account, to talk to Social Security, to talk to their retirement plan. You will also open up your bank account with the depository and it would be a restricted account and then they do an unrestricted account. So the restricted account is where the lump sum of the money goes. And then let's say we set up a budget that the person we need to pay for certain things every month. We get an order that transfers the money into the unrestricted account and you can write checks against that. And that's getting a little more technical. Um, but what happens once you're appointed? You have to get, um, I didn't put this on here, you have to get a receipt from the depository that is accepting funds for the guardianship because we have to create a paper trail as to where the person's funds are coming and going. You also have to do what's called an initial plan within the, um, the first 60 days. That's a form that's online. And basically that's projecting for the next year how you intend to take care of this person, where they're going to live, how many times you think they're going to go to the doctor, um, what's going to happen in, in, in case of an emergency, if there's a hurricane, et cetera. And then we also do an initial inventory, which is a snapshot of what the person owned at the date you were appointed as the guardian. So that's kind of our starting point for what we have to account for you are given 60 days in order to get that information because you may not have that information. You need to take your letters of guardianship to the bank to get bank statements, to change the mail, to get information about, um, you know, what the, what the person has and what we're dealing with. And then within four months after the day you're appointed, we have a, um, you have to do an eight hour class. It's an on demand class. I think the first seven hours you can take whenever, and then the last hour is at a designated time. They understand people are working, so they try to make it as convenient as possible. At the end, you get a little certificate, and we go ahead and file that in the court case. So how does the guardian access the funds of the ward? So we close down the ward's accounts. We put them into this depository. Then what? You have to pay bills. You have to take the person to the doctor, etc. So what we do is we put together a budget as to, let's just say they're in the facility. So we have to pay for the facility. We have to pay for medical insurance. We have to pay for prescriptions. We have to pay for clothes. We have to pay for 
um, dining out, hair, et cetera. So we come up with a monthly budget that we think the person is going to need every month. We file a petition with the court um, and then they set up, they enter an order where we can take the money from the restricted account to the unrestricted account and then the guardian can write checks. Everything has to be accounted for though. And then sometimes certain special things come up. Um, one time expenses, the ward needs dentures or needs new furniture. So we can also do interim petitions and get money released into um, the unrestricted account so the guardian can take care of the ward. So then what happens? Every year you have to do an annual accounting, which again talks about the money going in and out since the day you were appointed as guardian. We also do an annual plan, which again is projecting out for the following year how they intend to take care of their ward. The most important part of the annual plan is you have to get a it's a one page form filled out by the physician of the ward just to talk about, are there any rights they could take back? What's their prognosis? And the biggest thing is it's just to make sure the ward is okay. This is formal proof that the ward is still with us, is still receiving medical care. You do a, an updated application and in some circuits you do an updated checklist which is basically triggers another background check. So I tell my clients, you know, don't commit a felony in that one year because they won't catch it. So every year you have to do that. So there's a lot of work in the beginning. And then once you get everything set up for your ward, you really don't have to deal with the attorney unless you need something or until the end of the year. Here's some links and some information. Like I said, I gave a pretty general overview of this, but you can look at the Florida statutes, the guardianship statute, which is um, 744. Um, a great resource is this lighting to weight of guardianship. It's put out by um, the state and it's, um, I think it's the adults with disabilities, but it's a really great resource that talks about, goes into much more detail as to what the process is. If you want any more information, you know, please feel free to contact us. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that we had, and this is our second webinar. Our first webinar is Guardian Advocacy 101. It's on our YouTube channel. It is about what we call a guardianship light. If, let's say somebody has a developmental disability or Down syndrome. There's a different statute for adults with um, developmental disabilities. So they kind of work together. Um, if anybody has any questions, the last thing was, yeah, have you heard of legal guardianship before today? It was 50-50. Some people have heard about it. Some people haven't. Does anybody have any questions? Let me see. I'm looking at the wrong one. Okay. Um, so there's one question for an Alzheimer's dementia spouse. Would having a signed power of attorney be a better situation than a guardianship? Yes, but you have to do it before the person becomes incapacitated. That's why everybody over the age of 18 should have a power of attorney and a health care surrogate, um, which is something we can also help you with. Once the person has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia, unfortunately, they're not legally able to execute the documents. And that's when you would have to move into what I call guardianship land. What's the best way to avoid the guardianship process? Get your estate planning documents done. Get your power of attorney. Get your health care surrogate. I tell people to do it and you put it in a safe place and you go live your life and you don't worry about it. By doing those documents, you decide who is going to be in charge and take care of you and honor your wishes. The same rights that a guardian gets in court are delineated in the power of attorney and the healthcare surrogate. So I strongly suggest everybody do their estate planning, get a power of attorney, get a healthcare surrogate. They are honestly much more important, I believe, 
than a will. People say, oh, I want a will. It's like, okay, but we try to take a holistic approach to it and you need a power of attorney and a healthcare surrogate. Those are more important. And then that way you always are in control. You've decided who's going to have um, step in and take care of you. It's not some somebody appointed by the court. Again, the link to the Guardian Advocacy webinar, you know, feel free to go and check that out. This will also be recorded and available within the next few days. So if you have anybody you want to share this with, please feel free to do so. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming tonight. My contact information is here. You have any questions, feel free to email us or, uh, and again, if estate planning, we also do as well. So if you do your estate planning, you won't have to deal with this guardianship. I hope everybody has a good night and I thank you so much for joining. Be well, be safe.